Hey everybody, it's Greg Bendian. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome back, I should say, to our guest today, who's one of my all-time favorite drummers and just such a great musician. You know him from the group XTC, and he's back with another band playing the music of XTC, and I'll spell it for our listeners. It's EXTC, and his name is Terry Chambers. Welcome, Terry to the program. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. Nice to have you back. Last time we, we kind of went deep down the rabbit hole of, of some of your uh, XTC experiences, but I'm so excited because we're going to get to see you perform live in America for the first time in how many years? Well, it's at least 40 years, yeah. <laughs> that's, just round, that's just rounding it off. <laughs> We'll, we'll round down. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for, for taking the time. I know a lot of the fans are, are very excited that you're coming over to the U.S. to play this music. But tell me, you've been playing shows now with the band, the XTC, in England. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, we've we kicked off in, uh, in January. Um, we play again tomorrow evening. So today's off, but we're playing again tomorrow evening. And um, we've got a dates coming up, um, which is exciting, you know, uh, especially in like the fact that it's taken sort of two years really for this to uh, where it's at at the moment there for obvious reasons. And um, we're really pleased to sort of see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel and get back to some form of normality as regards um, as normal as rock and roll can be. <laughs> yeah, we've all been dying for the shows to start up again. Yeah. And we're, we're all excited that uh, that we can gig again and that we can go listen with other people in concert and have that experience again. Yeah. So t tell me who's who's in XTC right now? Uh, the band consists of uh, Steve Tilling on guitar and vocals, Steve Hampton on guitar and vocals, Matt Hughes on bass and also vocals. So we're just a four-piece outfit and um, the XTC set. So is it fair to ask what tunes we might be hearing from the catalog? No, it's completely unfair for you to ask. <laughs> Off we're playing. <laughs> no, of course it's fair. Uh, I refuse to answer that just at the moment there because this is going to be a surprise to people. But I think it, it might be nice to say that I'm hearing that you're playing some tunes that the band had not played live, the original XTC had not played live, right? Yeah, we're playing. Um, a cross section from nearly all the albums. Uh, uh, as you say, um, probably half a dozen of them I didn't actually originally play on, but um, because it's sort of like the whole XTC experience there, um, and there's a, um, quite a wealth of um, really good songs there. It's the difficult part really was not only learning to play some of these things, but uh, choosing which ones to play. There's certain ones there, I guess, play because they were reasonable hits. People would expect to sort of like see um, our interpretation of those. So, um, yeah, those ones are going to be there. And uh, hopefully there's a few surprises there as well. So um, and, and I, I hope that the people that turn up um, get a good interpretation of these songs. And the UK shows have been exciting for you? Yeah, uh, the tur turnouts have been very good, um, as, considering um, the conditions under which we're, we're at at the moment, which are um, the, the whole COVID situation has made, made things very difficult, um, you know, with everybody having to be tested beforehand, or the band at least, and the, and the, and the people that run these shows. Yeah, it's it hasn't been ideal, but um, you know we've got to sort of like break through this and um, and get on with it, I guess. So, so have you been throughout the UK with this? Um, well, we're about to embark on the northern part of the UK now. Uh, begins on Tuesday, I think. We're going heading up 
to uh, we've done some in the Midlands. We've done Wolverhampton and Derby and places like that. Um, Tuesday, we head up towards Leeds, York, Hull. We're going to Scotland as well. So um, yeah, hopefully the weather will be OK up there. You know, it's, it's, it's been very blustery over there uh, yesterday in particular. So um, hopefully all that will be gone by the time we get there. So I, I imagine that you're having fun engaging with some of your fans. Yeah, it's 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 strange, really, because um, we're coming out of the woodwork saying they saw us all those many years ago, and these other people thought that they'd never ever see any of these songs be played live. So, and there's a good cross section of old and new people, really. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 very nice to um, to go out and meet people again. And a, a lot of drummers in the audience. Um, yeah, there's a few people who have stolen a few drumsticks and uh, a few bits of memorabilia. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, indeed. I know that I'm I'm um, I'm sort of watering in the mouth about uh, getting a chance to, to see you play live for the first time when you come to America in March and April. And I know that I'll be bringing my son, who's a drummer and a huge fan of yours. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm feeling the pressure already. <laughs> no pressure for you, Terry Chambers. You got it. Well, uh, no, I think I think it's uh, as soon as when you sort of get complacent and you don't sort of feel a bit nervous and um, about your performance there, it's um, you sort of. I think it's time probably to give up. You know, you need to be excited about it and be kept on your toes uh, in order to sort of like do do the best job you can, I think. You know, you need a bit of edge, I feel. So where did you find these guys that, that uh, are playing the music with you? Well, um, Steve Tilling was playing with me when I did the uh, Colin and we did a few live shows. So Steve was in that band and we stuck together um, despite the fact that Colin decided to withdraw from that. We had a good time doing it and felt that um, we put a lot of time and effort into it. We wanted to continue on and see what we could do. I'm not quite sure how we end, ended up with Steve Hampton uh, on guitar, to be quite honest. I think he was recommended by London. I, I just can't recount exactly how we got hold of him, but he lives in Portsmouth. Um, he played in a band with the bass player, which is Matt Hughes. So um, they were in a band, and Steve and I were in a band. So we've just sort of joined forces, basically. Um, it's, uh, it's the best combination of, of individuals that we've we, we, we've come up against. It, um, we went through about thirteen different other musicians, to be, to be honest. Um, for various reasons, those individuals didn't quite fit. Were available at certain times so there's numerous reasons why that never happened but these guys have jumped in with both feet and um fantastic job and i'm sure longtime xtc fans uh yeah i think steve hampton is more of a crowded house fan actually but uh, <laughs> but um yeah I, I, they, they both sort of dig the music so um that makes it a little bit easier if 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 people are doing it for the right reasons rather than the financial rewards, you know? Well, I, I don't think you'd have much trouble finding a bunch of American chaps who'd want to play that music because I, I look on YouTube and I see bands playing these tunes now, covering these tunes. They're considered classics. Yeah. Well, um, Putting a band together, I mean, we, we tried with local musicians, to be honest, just because of the logistics thing about getting people rehearsing, as you well know, Greg, um, getting four people or, or the more in a room, the more people there is, the more difficult it becomes. I do know. <laughs> as, I, as I said, Steve Hampton comes from Portsmouth, which is probably an hour and, and a half away. Uh, and, um, Matt comes from Trowbridge, which is probably about 50 minutes away. Yeah, so we, we, we managed to rehearse the good guys. They've, they've, they've really dug in. But um, the further away people are, um, as you know, logistically and getting these things together is... 
So is your setup on the drums changing? Are you playing, approaching the music differently as a drummer? What, what, what's going on behind the drums? Uh, well, it's a fairly big drum kit, I guess. I think it's about eight piece drum kit there because of the versatility, I guess, not of the songs. Um, some of them are sort of like top orientated deeper, bigger sounds type of thing there. I'm using timpani sticks on a couple of songs and and some of the other stuff there leads, leads um, in a different direction there. So um, in order to, ju to justify these songs, you have to have the stuff available to you, you know, despite the fact that we're playing these songs without any keyboards. So that's, uh, it's, it's definitely sort of like a rockier version of these songs, I guess. Are you using any uh, electronic triggers or anything like that? No, no, I won't be using any of that. It'll all be just um, hands on and there'll be no in ears for me either. So, um, oh, really? Much, um, yeah, I mean, if uh, if people are going to be critical of it, it if, if, if the songs are either too fast, too slow, or they slow up or slow down, that'll be me. <laughs> I don't think I don't any. Think anyone would believe that you'd speed up or slow down you were you were known as a, a a human metronome in the day yeah you're putting too much pressure on me greg i can't handle this okay <laughs> i'm sorry to say it but we do think of you as someone who just really laid it in there and and made the music drive forward and and uh and that's something that well you sort of have to take on the mantle of that yeah, I, I suppose the technique's pretty much the same these days. Um, um, yeah, I, I guess, um, I suppose it's changed slightly. Um, fundamentally, I, I think sort of develop a certain style there. It's sort of continue on with that, I guess. Um, you know, I've tried to improve um, technique and, and the way I play. Just to make, just just to try and become a better better player. I mean, I never stop stop trying, really. Um, you know, no matter how old you get, um, probably the more difficult it becomes. But um, the body's not quite as supple as perhaps it used to be. But uh, I think I'm, I'm approaching it a little bit more intelligently these days than I did perhaps as a 21 year old. Where um, you know. It wasn't uncommon for me to go out and get um, pretty hammered the night before and realize that now that's uh, that's not the right way to go about it. No, I think I think maybe after a show, a couple of pints, but but yeah. maybe not, not before. Uh, never before. No, not now. Um, those mistakes um, are well and truly in the past. But um, yeah, I mean, we were young guys in the early days. And we were just we thought that that was the thing to do but you're still having a lot of fun nonetheless yeah yeah i mean it's great fun it really is and um we haven't got the pressure of a record company you know, pushing us behind we can sort of you know pretty much choose what we want to do ourselves without um and we we make the decisions as to what how much or how little we do which is a, a nice comfortable position to be in uh, rather than sort of, um, you know, having a big boss tell you what to do, you know. Oh, sure. You're, you're free and easy now because it, it, you're looking at a body of work that's just considered classic and, and stands on its two feet, you know, 30, 40 years later. And, you know, we're all excited that we're going to hear these tunes played in, in concert and you're coming to America. I did want to tell people some of the dates. March 19th in Seattle, March 20th in Vancouver, BC, March 23rd, Oakland, California, March 24th, Los Angeles, California, March 25th, San Diego, March 26th, Riverside, California, March 27th, San Juan Capistrano, California, Oh, it's a lot of West Coast dates there. And then oh, March 30th in Chicago, March 31st, Detroit, 
Michigan, April 1st, Cincinnati, Ohio, April 2nd, Pittsburgh, PA, April 3rd, New York, where I will be listening at Sony Hall, and April 5th at the Washington, D.C. City Winery, April 6th, Philadelphia City Winery, April 7th up in Daryl's house, Daryl Hall of Hall & Oates, April 7th, and then April 8th, oh, Boston City Winery, and then April 9th going up to Toronto. So that's that's quite a run of dates. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Um... It's going to be interesting to see how we handle it, really, because um, those are some distances there, especially from California to Chicago. I think the road crew have got three days to get there, so um, we'll be flying, fortunately. But a um, yeah, bit of a stretch, that one. So so what is your regimen? What is your your practice routine getting ready for, for playing this music? Because it's, it's very physical drumming, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that I get up um, usually uh, around about 9.30, which is, you know, a rock and roll lie-in, I guess. <laughs> Weather dependent, uh, it's a little bit more difficult in the wintertime, but I go for a bit of a run and have some breakfast and, you know, check out the emails and all that sort of thing there. And pretty much I, I go into the shed where I'm at at the moment. I've turned it into a rehearsal room and um, go down there and, scratch around down there and play for a couple of hours or, or whatever needs to be done. And, um, you know, sometimes the guys come around, Steve came around yesterday and we had a, a we were working on, um, some original material of our own, which we intend to, um, hopefully record at the end of the year when we've got a little bit more time, when we finished all these gigs, because obviously we're playing the States, we've got some more UK gigs to do when we come back in the summer, and uh, I think there's a festival involved with those as well. Um, then I think we're gonna, in, if everything goes well, we're gonna go back to the States again in October, I think, some more gigs there. And then November, I think we intend to go to Japan. So that pretty much takes the rest of the year up. And then I think after that, I think we're gonna try and see if we can um, to, um, this writing situation and maybe record a few things of our own. Oh, that would be great to, to hear some new stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's our intention is to, is to morph this band that we've got from being the um, XDC show that it is and becoming our own thing. Our intention is to move on so that um, you know, time next year, perhaps, um, we'll be able to introduce some of our material along with this other as well. And um, that goes down. So how did you go about choosing the, the tunes that you're going to play with the current band? Well, Steve and I uh, played with the, uh, the TC and I project with Colin. Uh, and we had probably songs there together so um and or colin's songs colin played i think it was we only played one of andy's songs on that particular thing there for one reason or another but when colin bailed out steve and i thought well andy's written some great songs we need to incorporate at least an equal share of those so we we pretty much knew our way around about 20 of colin's songs uh so we sort of started with those because we were familiar with those and then we decided to add, um, you know, I don't know, another 15 or so of Andy's songs as well. So I think um, there's two hours of material there that we've sifted through and we've we've dumped a few and, and added a few. So we've, Steve and I are sort of pretty much responsible for the uh, inclusion or exclusion of whatever these songs are at this particular point in time. Yeah, because I guess you'd have to choose uh, what songs you wouldn't be able to do with that kind of setup. Exactly. I mean, as the uh, progressed, um, you know, they were very reliant later on with uh, lots of keyboard stuff there and strings and all this sort of stuff. So some of those there we, we decided not to touch because we probably they were probably a little bit too studio studio. Um, 
orientated in, in as much that uh, kitchen sink of some of these. I don't think you even XDC would have been able to have performed some of them without the help of um, extra musicians and so on and so forth. But because they didn't play live, they didn't have to worry about it. So we, we tended to um, make sure that we, we stuck to the ones that we could do justice to, really. And that's yet to be determined by the people that turn up. <laughs> Do you get a, a lot of fan requests for certain songs? Uh, people have yelled out certain things there that, um, well, I think they were songs anyway. Uh, <laughs> but they were yelling. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, why don't you play so and so and so? But you've got to draw the line somewhere. And um, when we play on our own, it's basically two one hour sets. So um, you've got to stop somewhere. But that's a lot of music. That 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 would yeah. be a very. Very satisfying performance, yeah. Yeah. So uh, let me also read off some of the um, some of the UK dates coming up. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Basingstoke on the eighteenth. That's tomorrow. Of February. Yeah. Yeah. And then twenty second in Leeds, twenty third in Liverpool. 24th in Blackpool, 26th in Edinburgh, uh, 27 of February in Glasgow, uh, Glasgow, yeah. 1st of March in Hull, 2nd of March in York, 3rd of March in Carlisle, 5th of March in Shrewsbury, 25th of April in Bristol, 4th of Oh, then and then on after the uh, U.S. dates, you'll be in in May in Exeter on May fourth and Swansea on the sixth, and London on July tenth. So those are some upcoming dates in the U.K. Yeah, in actual fact, we've got um, quite an interesting date in I think it's July where we're playing with Clem Burke's band They're coming over. We're playing there in Brighton in the U.K. So I'm looking forward to that. We played with uh, Clem um, Blondie tour over here a long time ago, and um, they're part of the cross on numerous occasions. Um, we actually met him in New York, I think it was uh, the last time we went over, which was probably 40 years ago. Uh, um, he was managing a band called The Colors at the time, and he was there, and they supported us at uh, Austin that we were playing over there at the time. So um, it'd be interesting to go and play with him again in July when he comes over to it, over to the UK. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. That's very interesting, yeah. So, you know, as you know, and as many of the, the fans of your music and XTC's music know, this month is the 40th anniversary of the release of English Settlement. Apparently so, yes. Um, who'd have thought it? And you know what? Still sounds great. Yeah, I don't uh, play it these days, really. Um, I mean, I'm playing some of the songs from that record anyway on the live situation. So, um, yeah, I'm as surprised as anybody else that uh, it still gets to mention after all this time. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a credit to the band, I guess. Yeah, and it was your last recording with the band, or, and then maybe, no, you did a few songs on Mummer. Yeah, there was a couple there, but basically that was the um, end of it there, really. That was the last, certainly the last um, album that we toured anyway. Oh, yeah, and then this was uh, with you, Padgham, producing, right? Yeah, yeah, it was XDC and Hugh Padgham production, yeah. Which, Probably Andy, I guess, but uh, we all had a bit of a. Um, we all we all um, put our two bobs worth in, so to speak, as to um, the way the thing was going. But um, I think fundamentally, it was between Andy and Hugh that um, uh, produced that record. There's so many classic drum parts on that record, like on Ball and Chain, and uh, Fly on the Wall. There, uh, Snowman. Do you have favorites from that album of, of your particular performances? Well, uh, not particularly. Um, it was of one of the believers that it should have been a single album, to be quite honest. Um, 
uh, Andy was uh, pretty insistent that um, there was enough good material there to make two two records. The Virgin Records, who we were signed to at the time, weren't particularly keen on that idea. Oh. But um, yeah, nevertheless, it, it came out, and I believe that uh, in the United States, it only came out as a single record over there, I think. Um, and that was because the American... Uh, and I believe it was Epic at the time, if I if I remember rightly, um, decided that they knew their market better than us, and you know, double albums just weren't wasn't going to sell. So they um, they cut the they cut the record as a single. Yeah, I've seen it in both versions on vinyl. Yeah, and that's the case. I mean, um, just the record company's decision to do that. Um, I tend to to think that it would probably would have made a better single album, to be quite honest, but um, that's just not the way it turned out. Mm. Well, sometimes less is more. Yeah, um, Andy just sort of felt that if the, if the songs that um, didn't make it on the record, they, they would be sort of lost forever because he, 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 he sort of wanted to do his piece of work at that particular point in time, get it documented, and then obviously move on from there. He didn't want to sort of like leave that lingering on for the next album because as it turns out, the Mummer album was sort of in a slightly different direction. So um, on reflection, I could probably understand why he wanted to get that documented there and then, and uh, then then move on to what uh, Mummer was. Excellent point, really, because it is a different kind of XTC when you get to Mummer. Yeah. And, and different in a, in a good way, really, because it's constantly evolving over time. Yeah, I mean, I think Andy moved on because um, arguably the Drums and Wires album, the Black Sea album and the English Settlement album all had a similar sort of feel about them. And I think he felt that um, it was time to sort of perhaps show some sort of... I mean, he was obviously... He was a big keen on David Bowie as well, and Bowie always used to sort of move on. You never knew where he he was going to be next, and I think uh, Andy thought that was a good way of um, staying ahead of the game. You know, he was always trying to keep a bit ahead of the game, Andy. You know. But I think you did also. You your your playing evolved from white music up through uh, English settlement, right? Yeah. Um, but I think once again, I think that was due to the um, the songs that were being written. I think Colin and Andy became better songwriters as they went on, and the music uh, scene in general had changed from the early days, which was very much sort of like punk, say new wave, or stuff where uh, speed was of the essence. Um, you know, everything had to be fast and furious and over in three minutes of the time. Uh, by the time we got to the Drums and Wires album, of course, um, it was all about getting this, this the hit single out again, and things had m m gone back into some form of normality in that regard. Uh, um, I, I suppose Colin and Andy's songwritings reflect that from, from that point onwards. Things had changed again, you know? Music and of course, country, country. sorry. Please go so, ahead. Uh, yeah, music in this country sort of usually changes about every five years. There's usually a new broom that seems to sweep through. And, you know, what you're listening to, you know, five, five years ago is not relevant today. It seems to move on. In But that's progress, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you have to sort of like uh, move with the times, I guess, or, or be left... Um, and, and a lot of the punk bands in those days, they did dissolve, as did so many of the, um, before the punk thing, so many of the more rock metal bands um, never survived the punk thing. Uh, obviously, there's, there's you know, the classic band still weathered the storm in that regard, uh, but um, they didn't sort of come out of the punk thing particularly well. I mean, you know, there's only a handful of bands that sort of see that through and... Um, moved on, you know, I mean, the likes of U2, The Stranglers, those sort of bands, they, they weathered all that, uh, the, the, the punk thing there and went on to um, 
you could write great songs, you know. So that was the difference between, you know, sustainable bands and bands that were just in it for a bit of a lark, you know. Yeah. And you mentioned Drums and Wires, which is really the beginning of, for so many of us, that classic drum sound. Yeah, well, it was fortunate, really, that um, we ended up with Steve Lillywhite and Hugh Padgham on that record. And um, I don't know, just the whole thing seemed to gel. You know, um, we were very fortunate at that particular point in time to be working with those guys. And, um, and in the studio that we were, I mean, it was just, just all to come together. I mean, I love the, the, the first two records with Lecky and the material's great, the playing is great. But the drum sound is much more reined in, whereas starting with drums and wires, you know, things really started to open up and the drums become an equal voice in the group. Yeah. Yeah. Once again, as I say, um, in, in, in um, fairness to John Leckie, he could only record the songs that we had at the time. Uh, and Once again, it was an uh, insistence that um, a lot of music went on to the first album, White Music. And as a result of the music being on there, uh, it was quite a quiet album. If, if uh, hence we put the, uh, you know, play loud or not at all, because there was so much music on it and so many grooves on it that um, it diminished the actual volume of the thing. If you if you go back to a lot of the albums in the seventies, I mean, springs to mind is. Uh, the way free worked, you know, sometimes they'd have no more than four songs on either side of the it was um you know it, they sounded great those records, you know, but we had sort of like you know seven or eight on a side and and uh, the difference between the songs was that long and you know I think the 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 production side of it suffered as a result of that and um once again it was our naivety I suppose at the time there that um led that to um to be the case were you a fan of free and simon kirk absolutely absolutely yeah i mean i grew up with all those guys i mean simon kirk for heaven's sake you know just to mention one guy i mean obviously you know Brian danny from thin lizzy you know, alan white yes bill bruford i mean my ian pace john bonham i mean the list is endless i mean there's so many great i mean i'm only i'm only mentioning the english guys there's so many fantastic American drummers, you know. Well, I know you were a Cobham fan. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm just in awe of, of, of Billy Cobham. I mean, who, I mean, you know, to me, he's on the, the top of the heap, to be honest. I mean, that man is such, just sort of superhuman. Interesting, though, that he became known for treating the, the larger kit with all of the toms and all of the notes of the toms and creating parts for that in, yeah. in in a way in jazz rock the way that you were doing in rock well that's nice of you to say that but um <laughs> i think um billy cobham is uh just the ultimate musician you know um i i I don't compare myself in that 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 line at all, but um, it's nice of you to say so. But uh, very, we're very different uh, drummers. Sure. So we are talking about forty years since English Settlement came out, and obviously you've done other things since then. Uh, Steel Dragon, for one. Yeah. Dragon, that was um, an album that I did when I was out in Australia there. It was um, uh, one studio album and, and there was a, a live album recorded as well, which was um, which I quite enjoyed. The studio one, but um, it was um, a more of a mercenary approach to that. But the live album I thought was quite good. And your son is also a drummer. How is he doing? He's doing well. Yeah, they, they toured the States. Um, I think October Rage was the name of the band. Uh, but they are still sort of together there um, in a sense, but they haven't toured for a while there. And he's actually um, come over and, um, 
helped me on this tour. So you will meet him. He's going to come over and give me some assistance. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, well, we'll have to uh, we'll have to have a drink with our boys. Yeah. Well, my brother, my brother, my son is a non uh, non drinker, really. So um, he'll just have to sit there and supervise you and I. <laughs> he's he's the designated driver. Absolutely, he will be doing a bit of that, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's got to be a thrill for you to be able to be on the road with your boy. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah, I mean, when I was in Australia there and he was playing regularly over there, I, I was basically his road manager. So um, he's returning the favor, I guess, now. And um, But it will be quite exciting to sort of see his uh, happy, smiling face on the side of the stage. Um, yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. So what are you thinking that... Um... The American fans are expecting to hear from you guys. Yeah, it's uh, that's going to be interesting. Um, I think um, a lot of people have come out of curiosity. Uh, some, like yourself, um, may well have seen us before, uh, and once again coming there to see what what, what the whole thing's about. Um, some of the people will be turning up that have never seen us at all. And um, yeah, it's going to be exciting. Um, I think this is a good band and um, I've got no problem at all about sort of bringing these guys over there and delivering this stuff. I think um, I think they're doing a great job and I've got one full of confidence that um, it'll, it'll, it'll go well. It's a great opportunity because, as you say, it's it's been passed on now to to another generation. So you're you're seeing, I'm sure, you know, people your age that are showing up for the shows, bringing their kids. Yeah, it, yeah, it's exactly that. But when you think about it, there's very few bands going around these days of of our age that um, still have all the original members in those bands. I mean, there's very few. I think um, U2 springs to mind, but um, there's very few around now. I mean, sadly, some of the, the uh, musicians have uh, no longer with us. And um, some of them have decided that uh, they're too ill to, to play. And many of them only, only got one member anyway. So um, we're not alone in that uh, regard. So um, they've just got to make up their own mind as to whether they choose to sort of uh, come out and see these things or not. But um, as close as they're going to get to it, because the others are not going to be doing it. Right. In, 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 in our case, anyway. Yes. Well, Terry, this is so great to catch up with you. And, and we're very excited that you're coming to the US. And I know a lot of people are going to be coming to to hear these songs and to be surprised by which songs you're going to play. I know that I'm I'm waiting with bated breath. And I know that uh, I'm sort of curious as to how this is going to work out, especially since is it true that you're going all the way from white music up until the Apple Venus period? Yeah, that's pretty much the case. I think the only album that we don't touch is Go To. For one reason or another, we did. We may well at some point there perhaps put one of those songs in, but um, as it stands at the moment, that's the only one that's missed out. So there's something off of everything else there. So, um, but I'm sure, you know, Somebody's going to be yelling out for something there that um, we won't be playing. But as I said, it's a two-hour show, predominantly, uh, and you can't play them all. So, <laughs> can I shout one out though for you? You may. <laughs> Go to has Beat Town. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> that has been mentioned. I know. <laughs> We're in the middle of this tour at the moment there, and. Um, we've got everything sort of like um, pretty much uh, set in place here with our sound guy and one thing or another. And um, it's it's a little bit late at the moment just, just to throw that one in, but um, never, never. And um, there's a possibility, perhaps in the in the future, that might come on. But um, yeah, yeah. Go to has 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 a few real real stompers there. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> but it sounds like you've got so much ground covered with this and and it's a kind of retrospective of of XTC's music. Yeah, um you know, we're looking forward to it immensely and um it's it's good fun. They're a good bunch of guys to be with as well. I mean, that makes that makes it really is uh gets on well and um yeah, it's it's a good bunch of guys to be with. Well, we're looking forward to that. Terry Chambers, thank you so much for taking the time to talk. And uh, this has been the broadcast with Greg Bendian and my very special guest, Terry Chambers from XTC. Look for these guys to come around to your area. And uh, I thank you so much for taking the time to talk, Terry. No problem, Greg. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure.